Thank you for that lovely song. I wish I can just sit down and listen to such songs. But I have something to do, so maybe next time. One plus one equals one. No, I'm not talking about the union of the husband and the wife. I'm talking of something far deeper than that kind of union. I'll be discussing to you tonight a union more profound. For in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Let us pray. Heavenly Lord, Heavenly Father, please make us understand what you want us to know about you. Lead us to a comprehension of your will and grant us the strength the determination to carry out your will in our lives that we may become the kind of children you want us to be, ready to enter into the glories of that kingdom that beckons us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If Jesus was not who he claimed to be. If Jesus was not he, was not who he claimed to be, his contention equating him with the Father would be a most glorious lie. However, the rest of the New Testament does uphold Jesus' divinity, and for that matter, there is no warrant for us to claim otherwise. There is, of course, a whole set of progressive historical and theological data and confirmed proceedings which led the early church to make a sustained stance which viewed Jesus as indeed equal with the Father. Because this is not a class, we shall not occupy ourselves with materials along that line. However, I want to make a proposal which provides a valid framework for Jesus' words of equality with the Father, or Jesus' words of oneness with the Father. I propose that Jesus' view of himself being one with the Father is borne out by two things. Firstly, the authority with which he makes things happen and secondly, his insistence that people express belief in him. Let me repeat that. I propose that Jesus' view of himself being one with the Father is borne out by two things. Firstly, the authority with which he makes things happen. And secondly, his insistence that people express belief in him. Apparently, the question of authority is an issue most alive amongst the people of the New Testament, quite particularly during the times of Jesus. In fact, Jesus' authority had been questioned not a few times. You remember, at the conclusion of his discourse on the Mount, Matthew noted that those people who heard Jesus' words affirmed that his authority was different, very much unlike that of the scribes. So the record says in Matthew 7, 29, for such display of authority, Jesus generated much awe, much astonishment from the people. Look, look for his part, recorded Jesus' initial foray into an authoritative ministry with the latter's quote of the Isaianic declaration found in Luke 
chapter 4, verses 18 to 19, where Jesus proclaimed the words very, very familiar to most of us. He said, standing in front of the synagogue with the people listening to him, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Having said that, he retreated from where he was. And in verse 21 of chapter 4 of Luke, the evangelist recorded for us the closing words of Jesus, which sets people's minds and hearts into a frenzy of questions. For there, Jesus said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Look, look was not an original apostle of Jesus. Look also was not your ordinary Bible writer. Look was skilled in Greek narrative and employed various figures of speech to convey his thoughts. He was a master of irony, as several scholars have pointed out. Where he could, he would use words designed to create an impact directly opposite of what he employed. Ordinarily, and you find the verse in verse 22 of Luke chapter 4, Let's read that particular verse so it will be clearer to us. Chapter 4, verse 22. After Jesus told them, Today your scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, verse 22 went on. It says, So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? They marveled, marveled at the gracious words which came out of his mouth. Ordinarily, the word gracious or charis in verse 22 would be understood to mean kind or wonderful. But here, look was trying to point out an attitude of the heart and the mind of those who were listening to Jesus who was actually being carefully watched. Thus, the words of Jesus were scrutinized, appraised, subjected to examination. So when Luke used the word charis or gracious, it was not meant as an offer of compliment. It was actually meant to stress the irony, perhaps the sarcasm, of an audience who could not identify with Jesus' own understanding of who he was. That explains the presence of the question in the same verse. At the end of that verse, the question was asked, Is this not Joseph's son? So if Luke was not trying to be ironic, there is no need for him to put that question at the end. Is this not Joseph's son? And the subsequent words that emerged from Jesus affirmed the scorn thrown his way by his listeners. Ultimately, and as the rest of Luke 4 indicate, the gathering in that synagogue became turned to a frenzied mob bent on destroying Jesus. So you get to verse 28, verses 28 to 29, and Luke made this summary. 4, 28 to 29. 
So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him into the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. The people in that synagogue resented Jesus. The people in that synagogue rejected the authority with which Jesus tried to bear himself up. You see, throughout the Gospels, the issue of Jesus' authority was a continuing concern. Lawyers, under the authority of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, would attempt to entrap him, hoping to pin him down and destroy his credibility. But that authority with which Jesus worked out his mission became also the authoritative shield that protected him from his detractors. Let's go to John. Mark has his own way of propping up the authority of Jesus, but it is the authority with which John described Jesus and the authority with which Jesus manifested himself in the book of John that is our concern tonight. The approach of John the evangelist with regard to the authority of Jesus assumed a heightened sense in the book of John. For in John, Jesus' authority became decidedly divine-like. I am using the term divine-like to indicate a progression of thought that already took place by the time John wrote his gospel. Jesus in John was no longer just the son of the carpenter from Galilee. Jesus in John was not just the person who gave command to his disciples to exorcise demons and evil spirits from those possessed. In John, in the book of John, Jesus was the one authoritative person who received power to execute judgment. In John 5, 27. In John, Jesus stood as the one who has power over life and death. This by Jesus' own testimony. That is why in John 10, 17 to 18, we read the following words spoken by Jesus. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. By the time it came for Jesus to return to heaven, he was telling the disciples one of the most powerful manifestations of his supreme authority. And what was that? The sending of the Holy Spirit. Actually, to the Jews, one of the most irrefutable signs of divinity is for one to have the power to send out the Spirit of God. And Jesus in the book of John displayed that, mentioned that emphatically. Jesus declares in John 15, 26, when the counselor comes, when the helper comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. He will not just testify of Jesus, but will also teach and bring to remembrance everything that Jesus taught and told his disciples. Let me repeat that verse again. John 15, 26. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And I'm reading that from the New International Version. 
Listen and take note of this very carefully. Who will send the Spirit? Jesus. From whom is the Spirit sent out? From the Father. But if Jesus is the one who sends the Spirit, and the Spirit is sent from the Father, does this not make Jesus and the Father one and the same being? It is in this context that Jesus claims authority for himself in the book of John. And so he can say without equivocation that he is one with the Father. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Some versions go one further away or go one further away using a possessive personal pronoun and so you have the rendition, I and my Father are one. But to just be true to the text, let's just stick to what Jesus said. I and the Father are one. Let us go to that other point that draws us to the superb identity of Jesus or oneness of Jesus with the Father. I mentioned to you that in the New Testament, especially in the context of the life of Jesus, authority is so significant, so crucial, so important. And it is with that authority that Jesus is able to demand from people who are listening to him, that one word that comes next, that word, belief. The book of John is the gospel of faith, the gospel of belief. When Jesus declared, I and the Father are one, that declaration springs from an unusual analogy where Jesus compared his children to sheep. Modern minds find this analogy very intriguing, very interesting. Imagine highly intelligent people being compared to what they call dumb ship. But Jesus used this analogy in order to stress the need for us to understand what we need to do if we truly want to enter into the glorious kingdom he has been preparing for all of us. In very clear ways, Jesus said, his sheep, his sheep know his voice. And having known his voice, they obey him. Funny, interesting, that Jesus established his oneness with the Father through the use of the sheep analogy. Jesus is the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. His sheep knows his voice and follows him. His sheep follows him not just because they know his voice, but they trust his voice. They have faith in his voice. Ship, ship, definitely we are not. We are people with minds, with intelligence, with ability to comprehend things given by God. Capability to analyze situations. Capacity to understand God even though God cannot be understood by puny wicklings like us. Yes, there is a sphere in which we can say we understand God, but only up to a certain point. Because when we begin to understand God in His totality, 
we cease to be mortals. Yes, we are people. More than sheep, we must be those who are discerning enough to know the voice of the good shepherd. And if we know the voice of the good shepherd, then we should follow that voice. And if we follow that voice because we believe in the being who owns that voice, then we can truly be called the ship of his pasture, the children of his kingdom. And when we follow that voice, we realize that it is the voice of God talking to you and talking to me, calling us, his children, to be mindful of the things that pertain to the kingdom of God. After declaring to the Jews that he and the Father are one, something happened. The record says that the Jews attempted to stone Jesus for blasphemy. But with sharp words of rebuke and incrimination, Jesus made the Jews understand the futility of their situation. Let's look at it in the context of the works of Jesus. Jesus said, if I don't do the works of God, don't believe me. Jesus told them, if I don't do the works of God, don't believe me. But if I do, though you don't believe me, at least, at least believe the works for in believing, you may know and you will come to believe later that the Father is in me and I in Him. In John's own way of doing things, we are here confronted by a proof of Jesus' oneness with the Father. His works. The works Jesus did were of the Father. And in acknowledging those works, by us acknowledging the works of Jesus, we are eventually led to a life of believing and trusting. Mind you, the insistence of Jesus that people express belief in Him are not forced actions by which we are made to decide against our will. Let me repeat that. Jesus' insistence that people express belief in Him are not forced actions by which we are made to decide against our will. It is simply that a person who believes in what Jesus did will find the next step too difficult to resist. For why will you not believe in Jesus the person if you have already believed in the works of that person? Why will you not believe in Jesus the person if you have already believed in the works of that person? And nobody during the times of Jesus could deny the works that Jesus did. To the blind, he gave back their vision, their sight. To the lame, he made them walk. To the deaf, he made them to listen again to the songs that draw the minds of people to the things that God had been preparing. And even to the lifeless people witnessed became witnesses of Jesus giving back the life of those who perished. Literally. And just in our context today, spiritually. One step 
leads to another. It is that simple. Believe in the works of Jesus. Because Jesus did those works. There is no discussion on that. Jesus did the works of the Father because the Father is in him and he is in the Father. The crux of the matter is this. Jesus personifies God. Jesus personifies the Father. He has power and authority. Jesus, by his works, gives us a clear understanding of who he is. Jesus is the Savior, the coming King, the Messiah, the hope of the world. What is puzzling is that many take Jesus for granted. So what if he is the Savior? So what if he is the coming King? I've heard many Christians react negatively to the idea of Jesus returning very soon. I know of a mother who, when I was emphasizing the return of Jesus, she came to me and said, Pastor, please do not pray for the return of Jesus very soon because my child has not finished her studies yet. And then another came to me and said, Pastor, please don't make us nervous by saying Jesus is coming because I have not yet paid my house in full. Many people misunderstand Jesus. They seem to understand that Jesus is only here with us in this life. And in this context, Paul comes in very strongly. He was saying, if in this life alone we have Jesus, we are of all creatures the most to be pitied. Jesus is not for this earth alone. Our hope in Jesus goes beyond this sinful earth. I want you to know that. And I want you to be made aware of that very, very emphatically. Yes, it is puzzling that many people take Jesus for granted. It is puzzling that some professors even say that it's okay to believe in Jesus. It's okay to follow Jesus so long as you don't get caught up too much in what he is saying. But Jesus will no longer be Jesus if you don't take his words. At least for you, Jesus will no longer be Jesus if you don't believe his works. At least for you, but for somebody, for that somebody who believes in Jesus, who takes Jesus and his words and who believes his work, I tell you, he will enter into the glories of the new heaven and the new earth. Many Christians today profess Christianity. And it's, it's, it's a word that has been mentioned over and over again. What we have today are Christians who, have, who are Christians only by mouth. We call it the lip service Christianity. They heard the words of Jesus. They read in the Bible his mighty works. They refused to follow him all the way. And this makes Christianity so difficult for unbelievers to accept. They ask, if Jesus is your Lord and coming King, if Jesus did those things in his lifetime, and if Jesus is really your coming Savior, your Redeemer, why is it that your life is not constantly, consistently, continually lived in Jesus? In Jesus, the kingdom of God beckons. 
in Jesus. He wants us to truly make our lives a manifestation of his life. By our exemplary life, following Jesus, believing in him, recognizing his authority over our lives, we actually lead others to know Jesus, to believe in Jesus. We then become true disciples of Jesus, ready any time to enter into the glories of his kingdom. You're not just one Christian sitting on a chair, sitting in one of the pews. There is a reason why you are a Christian. And that reason is for you to lead others to recognize the authority of Jesus, to know who Jesus is, and to believe in Jesus. Because a lifeless, joyless Christian is that Christian who does not do anything to lead sinners to Jesus. I have always believed that a person who becomes an instrument of God, who becomes an instrument of Jesus in knowing what salvation is, is the person who would be the most joyful. Sad to say, many of us have lost our joy following Jesus. Many of us do not know anymore how to truly feel joyful because of somebody being baptized. I think the idea of us seeing people baptized daily every Sabbath after big crusades have sort of given us, given us some kind of immunity, have sort of anesthetized us that when we see somebody being brought to Jesus, somebody being baptized, we just say, yeah, praise the Lord. Next. There is a danger in not being connected with Jesus every day. Our hold on life is very, very fragile. The spider's web is even stronger than our hold on life. Do you realize that? That's why it is so necessary for us to constantly, to continually, consistently hold on to Jesus. Because by holding on to Jesus, we make or give ourselves an assurance that we will enter into the glorious kingdom of heaven. Many years ago, during the wars that was that were waged by Napoleon and his cohorts. There was a group of his men who went around the countryside trying to enlist people forcibly into Napoleon's army. There was this particular farmer who was vigorously, vigorously chopping wood and then from a distance he heard the sound of horses' hooves, and he knew right away those are soldiers of Napoleon. Without any preparation, he ran. He ran for cover. Too late. The soldiers saw him, and they ran after him. You cannot, run, uh, you cannot outrun a horse. So they got him, and they told him, you will be conscripted into the army of Napoleon. You are now his soldier. The man said, no, I am another man's soldier. You are now Napoleon's soldier. No, I am another man's soldier. And with that, he ran away and soldiers took off after him, eventually got him back. And this time, they pinned him down. Somebody start, started a fire, took out a metal brandishing equipment, and uh, 
Pretty soon, the tip of that branding equipment was really, really, very, very red. One of the soldiers took it from the fire, lifted up that brandishing equipment, and uh, stretched out the hand of this farmer at the end of that Brandishing equipment is uh, branding equipment is a circle, and inside the circle was the letter N, standing for Napoleon. They stretched out the hand of this poor farmer, and psh, you can smell flesh burning. The farmer was struggling; he couldn't do anything because he was pinned by strong arms he was in tears crying not just for the pain of it but crying for the thought that his arms now bear the mark of Napoleon then they let him go he stood down very very low And the soldiers all around him were laughing, ridiculing him, scorning him. And suddenly, this farmer sprang up and saw one of the swords of the soldiers. And the soldiers were so startled, they didn't know what to do next. And before they knew it, this man raised up his arm where the letter N was imprinted, emblazoned in his arm. He raised the sword and with one stroke took off his arm, his own arm. And in tears, he held up that cut, that severed of what was left of his arm. And he said, that arm may be Napoleon's. But the heart belongs to a man named Jesus. We need, we need to be constantly connected with Jesus. Because when we are connected with Him constantly, continually, consistently, nothing on this earth will prevent us from entering into the glories of that heavenly kingdom. God is calling you, my brother. God is calling you, my sister. I don't know who you are. I don't know your challenges, your trials, your problems, your concerns. One thing I know, Jesus has the authority to help you to guide you into the kingdom but you have to believe in him you have to have trust in him you have to make him the lord and master of your life heavenly father i pray that you will lead us to an understanding of what you want us to be we're not just here as students. We're not just here as professors. We're not just here as staff. But I'm praying, Lord, for all of them, nevertheless. What I want to really pray for, Father, my Father, is that you will lead us not just to see in the Bible the works of our Savior, Jesus Christ, but acknowledge His authority over our lives and to believe in His capacity to truly lead us into that everlasting kingdom, that glorious kingdom now prepared for all of us. Accept Oh, Father, our sinful selves, cleanse us from all of our sins. 
Give us hearts worthy of your calling. Lead us. Father, help us to understand you and make us the kind of witnesses, disciples, who will be instrumental bringing others also into the kingdom because it's not just us who have the privilege or the right to enter into that kingdom, but others around us as well so long as they recognize the authority of Jesus and so long as they believe in Him. And together, we will all enter into the gloriousness of your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.